satellite operations. You will release new content packs, new episodes, new DLC, even for a premium game. Um, but for online titles, PC online titles, mobile free to play games, live ops is how you monetize. You know, um, for for example, for puzzle games, you release level packs, and they, as the users burn through those levels, they tend to buy power ups or to uh, buy hints in a um, in a kind of trivia style game, um, and uh, and and therefore it is very important that every month you release new content in order to provide monetization opportunities to your users. Um, this phase is um, um, actually very tightly structured because at the point that you release a title in the market, you should have a pretty clear idea how you will operate it. It means that all the tools and the inputs that you require for live operations have to be part of the game design from day one. And fully executed during the production phase. Um, literally, once you're out into the market, yes, you may be developing new features, making the game more feature complete as a result of user feedback, which you are collecting through the forums, and you already, or you also should be collecting through your analytics engine that you've integrated into the game. Um, so you're generating dashboard, figuring out how the users are playing the game, and figuring out features and optimizations of existing features to make that game more performant. For example, if you're looking at the fact that at some point in the game you have a steep drop-off of users, you're losing about half of your user base just there, um, and you never recover from that, obviously, because you're you know, they're going away, you really have to do something about that point in the game. Maybe your difficulty for that particular section of the game is too high, and you have to intervene to change the difficulty so you lose less uh, players. So that's an example of uh, Futui uh, optimization. And usually that the steep drop-off happens during the first time user experience, during the tutorial phase of your game. Um, and you want to make sure that that experience is as smooth as possible. Once you got, got past the tutorial and the users are in the game, assuming that your game is fun and it's delighting players, you already have hooked them in, in a sense. You have a really good chance of retaining them, and if you retain users in our world, that means you monetize. Um, on premium game, this post-production phase, as I've mentioned, is about kind of continuing to enhance the experience through um, additional episodes, content, packs, DLCs. Um, once again, the community plays a role here. The community will tell you through the forums, uh, most often also maybe comments on your Facebook page, um, maybe um, uh, Discord, you have a Discord channel, the users could be active there expressing their wishes, um, they will tell you what they want to see. You know, they'll tell you, oh, it would be really cool if this game will be based in this particular location. Um, it would be really cool if we found the fate of this character. You know, in a narrative game, maybe there's a branch of like what character goes away, you never hear about him or her again, and that would be an interesting thing to explore through DLC. They'll tell you where their interest lies. You should listen to the community and cater to their desires, particularly if you're able to segment in a, in a free-to-play game or a PC online game, you have uh, whales, big spenders. It's uh, especially useful to, to listen to them because you want those high spenders to be happy and, and to feel they have a voice in development uh, and that they're engaged. And yes, you can send them t-shirts. The, um, the whales. Uh, you can send them, you know, mugs with the, the name of your studio. Uh, I, I heard that Zynga, for example, had an incredible policy for whales. You know, once you reach a certain amount of spending, they will like send you to Las Vegas. With oh, really? Mm -hmm. I'm not kidding. Well, wow. <laughs> yeah. But these are users that have spent more than 100k a lifetime. You know, and uh, apparently that happened quite a bit. Oh you know? yeah. <laughs> So then you can do something like that extraordinary. Yes, it'll set you back, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars, but you know you're gonna make that money back from that user because they continue to spend like crazy in your games. Um, and don't forget that Zynga also has a, a lot of social casino games, mm -hmm. like Zynga Poker, for example, 
and yes, you get like gambling addicts that are going to spend enormous amount of money. Yes. How uh, how do you balance the resources between creating new titles and maintaining existing ones? Great question. Um, one so one way you can do it as a studio is to create a track, a live ops track. Uh, resource it to the needs of the product, uh, and then take everyone else off that project and onto a new one. Um, that means, in effect, that we'll be operating two tracks in the studio, which has uh, some impact on the management bandwidth. You have to create a structure that can scale to accommodate two tracks, because you cannot have just one single producer, one single project manager, uh, as maybe you had before they created the second. So you, you need to make sure that the second track is self-sufficient, fully contained, uh, and set up for performance, you know, to do a really good job. Um, the other way you can do it, if you don't want to grow your studio, um, which by the way, it's also an okay choice, as you know, we scale down the complex set of problems um, that you have to manage, and that's sapping your energy, takes your focus away from other things. The other way you can do it is to hire another studio to do your live ops. Let's say you've already released a title in the market, it's been, been out there for a year. Um, all your live ops systems are finely tuned. You're not creating new features, you're basically only creating new content and operating events. It's monetizing, it's very stable as a title. Um, there's no technical debt that you're particularly concerned about. In that particular scenario, your title could be up to be transferred to another studio. Um, so basically, you'd have an external development relationship with that studio. You'd uh, work alongside them for a little while to onboard them, to train them on how to operate the game effectively. Once you feel they are strong enough to run on their own, you can take your hands off and you wish them good luck. Um, and hopefully they do an amazing job because you've selected the right studio. Yet the other option that you can look at is to use a specialized vendor. So there are some companies in the space, uh, Amber included, that will take your game and operate it. Um, and you know, there's obviously a fee involved. It's probably more expensive to do that than, than to do it fully internally. Uh, but you know, the extra expense is not debilitating, uh, and it definitely takes like a, a how should I say, a heavy load of responsibility on the shoulders of your team, it may be worth paying the, the margin. Um, so these are three options that you have, you know, and it depends on kind of how you see the world, you know, what you want to invest your energy in to select the one that makes more sense. Usually, uh, it's easier to uh, onboard a specialized uh, service partner that does live ops than to onboard a new studio. Um, there's also a pretty um, heavy degree of risk when you are reliant on a single studio because effectively you may um, see the studio go out of business or I don't know, maybe they were trying to do the same thing that you were avoiding which is they have their own game, yeah. their best people are on their game, they sell you a bill of goods initially, they say oh this is the team that we have deployed on the project, you're like wow what an amazing team but those guys go away <laughs> from the project to do something else. Um, I mean, literally all of these scenarios that I have just outlined could happen. Um, they're probably a lesser uh, concern with a specialized vendor because they have already achieved some scale uh, and they have quite a bit of expertise. Uh, doing it in-house may be your first option. Uh, that's usually indies will try to do that, but it's not easy to scale. So, um, if you feel at some point it is taking you away from the craft of making games, uh, and you have to be a people manager and spend a time, a ton of time in Outlook, sending emails <laughs> instead of being coding or creating beautiful art or designing, uh, then um, then you should look at externalizing to one of the other Okay. Um, Uh, I would say this is um, fairly straightforward work. Um, your feature watch probably expires. At some point, it really doesn't make sense to add more features to your game. It's, uh, you're getting dwindling benefits. 
and the game becomes maybe needlessly complex. Um, but you do need to pay attention to your elder game. Um, you know, those users that invested already hundreds of hours into your game, they need to have cool and exciting stuff to do and you cater to the cohort. Those are your primary, that's, that's your best bet at monetizing, is that cohort of elder players that have been with you for a year, maybe two years, maybe five years. Um, and if you alienate those guys, you lose the majority of your revenue with them. So um, those old players that have already invested in your game, it's absolutely sinful to lose them. If, you're, if, you, if they continue to trick a lot of your game, you need to address that systemic problem that they're um, running away from, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you need to identify. Hopefully, if you have good analytics, a good product pro product manager interpreting, um, you have seen that issue way before it started to affect your cohort. Your cohort. All right, post production. In a um, uh, in a nutshell, that's what it is. I don't know if there's anything unclear here. Um, the only thing that I would add uh, that is very important. Um, again, please uh, continue to test. Um, and now you have user data for the first time ever. You have large sample of users. Yeah, one second. Uh, you have a large sample of users that you can constantly measure. Uh, you have no reason uh, not to have a quantitative design approach to your game. Meaning that if you release a feature, the user, your users will immediately tell you if they like it or not. If they don't like it, take it out. You know, you can make those decisions. It's a very clear cut to designing it. That's why usually the best policy uh, for a, a title with significant live ops component is to release the MVP and release the next features in cadence afterwards. The community loves to see the game continuing to be developed. The community loves to see their favorite features appearing in the game. And furthermore, you can test how well you have executed the feature by looking at how the users are playing, are interacting with that feature. Yes? When we hear the, the post-mortem analysis? Yes, absolutely. Um, so post-mortem at the end of the project is a good idea, even if your project has been successful. Um, there will always be learnings that you can derive from what has happened. Uh, just so you know, at Amber, we sometimes do mid-mortems. Because some event may have happened that we don't fully understand. And then we take some time to figure out. But this is called a Kaizen moment uh, in kind of the lean management literature. It's basically a time of reflecting on what has gone wrong for us to be in this situation. Usually, um, the way we handle a problem that appears on the project is there's quite a bit of firefighting, and that's very much in the moment and directive. And uh, so we may bring resources from other teams, or we may intervene on the business end to kind of solve that issue. But then we really need to have a Kaizen moment where we think, OK, how did we get into this pickle? <laughs> um, so what I'm saying here is, yes, it's great to have a postmortem at the end of the project. You can list everything that went well. You can list everything that didn't go well uh, and what we should be doing better in the future. Um, but it's not the only time in the history of the project where you may want to do that. And it's the idea of having a mid-mortem. <coughs> if, for example, you encounter some issues in production, with your people are demotivated, and yes, you're doing some firefighting, you know, one on ones with key people that want to leave or that, you know, have professed um, dissatisfaction with the studio or the company or the product. Uh, after that firefighting, you really have to kind of assess why didn't we get into this trouble? How come we didn't see it earlier? What can we do better in the future? Great question. Yes. What would be uh, your criteria for killing off the game? For killing off the game? Mm -hmm. um, well, so the most straightforward one is that it does not meet the green light criteria that is set up in the GDI. You know, they roll into pre production green light uh, and they have an unconvincing prototype or they haven't tested. 
or they have them compile the product requirements like it. Or their vertical slice is not at release quality <laughs> when we are in the production treatment. Um, or that the DDD is pretty loose, fast and loose. Three pages, it looks like it was written in like 15 minutes. Uh, with some graphics, like architecture stuff from people of the internet. I mean, it can be almost any reason uh, for not meeting the green light criteria, and we would kill it. Now, I can think of scenarios where we kill something midway through production. It has actually happened with a trivia uh, game that we are building for Universal. They have no, nothing to do with our internal performance. We had everything to do with the fact that Universal changed business strategy uh, and became from a game production. They had a game development division where they, they were producing games, uh, but they elected to close that division and move into licensing. So they just right now they're just licensing IP, um, and that's all fine and dandy uh, for them. For us, it meant that our funding for the trivia game died. You know dried out, so we had to find a new project for that team. Uh, and we had to basically place the trivia game on, on ice uh, until we find another publisher we need to support the cost of finishing. So you know, it can happen between gates. Each of those green lights is basically a gate yeah. in the GDF. Uh, but it's relatively rare. And it's usually because something happens in the market or outside of the company that affects us. Um, otherwise, I, we tend to kill at the gate, uh, at any gate. Predominantly, we kill uh, after uh, at the pre-production gate. That's a good point to kill. You have enough information, be like, okay, this is really not working. It doesn't make sense to throw more money. Um, another, the second favorite place is uh, at the end of the pre-production gate. Uh, if you kill at the uh, post-production gate, like the go-to-market gate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a ridiculous yeah. point to kill, <laughs> to kill a game. Uh, it has never happened to me, and I don't know of any game that was killed at go-to-market. Because that means you're asleep all the way through production. Um, you should also have, because the production phase is so long, not, not because it's a kill gate, but because it's good practice, you should have milestone review. The entire team, you have milestone markers, usually the milestone are three to four sprints. You can define what is the, the length of a milestone effectively. Your sprints can run one or two weeks, again, preference. Um, and uh, and the milestone review, you can you know, perhaps uh, address any, any risks uh, and issues. Uh, that may appear with the game. Again, uh, not using the milestone review as an opportunity to kill. Once you green light something into production, it is assumed that you've done your full homework and you're securing your decision to invest in the game. Okie dokie, post production. And that is uh, the GDF. Okay, so let's do a quick recap. We're looking, looking at everything. Make sure that we retain all of this. We have the, the ideation phases, we're primarily about market research and some high level concept research to make sure that you are kind of hitting a, a viable business opportunity. You have the concept stage. <coughs> you, when you are finally uh, assembling this product requirements document, the high level design. In the prototype stage, you're creating uh, obviously a prototype uh, to test the fun in the game. Um, during this stage, you're also taking the opportunity to flush out the game design document. Then you go into pre-production, where you build your vertical slice. Um, that is, uh, you know, the game at release quality for a particular segment. That gives you information to finally be able to project the timeline and the budget, and then you move on into production. Please watch the team when you're in production to make sure that your development velocity doesn't drop and you end up in development hell. Uh, and then you release into the market and operate successfully and forever, ideally. Um, I wanted to show you some examples of reports. I mentioned that you know, part of the, uh, the reason that we are looking at this process is also to uh, kind of assess uh, appropriate reporting. 
Um, and now we will give you some real life examples. Some of the most recent reporting that our studios have issued. <coughs> Let me see what we have. So this is for a live ops project. Um, so this is Dungeon Boss. This again has been in the market for five years when we took it over. Wow. Uh, we took it over about a year ago. Um, and it's still going strong. Um, and we have milestone, key, key milestones. So the way we work with that team is that we're even we're not fully operating, so we're not fully controlling the title. They like to keep a core team on site, and we're augmenting their studio effectively. Um, and they're having us work on features and on content uh, to support their events. Um, and you'll see here the uh, the goal of the project is kind of so first was what the week's objectives. We asked the potential live issues with the boss battle event. Finish working on the boss battle event for release. <coughs> Continue working on four new gold heroes. The heroes are our primary means for this game to monetize. And um, and um, you know start uh, working on the new client on the patch and continue bug fixing, just like resolving like tech legacy issues. Um, to have deliberate dates for particular things that we worked on. Um, as you can see, we have released most of the stuff. We're currently working on Light versus Dark event. These are next plan releases. Um, an executive summary is always a good idea. Obviously, it's split by disciplines. Um, tells you what has happened within the spring in a more detailed fashion. Um, for each discipline, what last week, this week, and next week. So it's a good kind of historical tracker. Um, there are some risks. You catch any risks. Um, you have a trigger for the risk. Like you know when the trigger occurs, then basically this this becomes a critical item. Um, there's a mitigation plan already in place here, um, and that's the report. It's not the most exciting report issue when we do live ops on a full title, we'll also include analytics. Um, it's another report for the game that we're building for NC Soft. Okay, same idea, we have goals, um, milestone evolution here. We're currently working on milestone 8, as you can see. What we were working on last um, uh, These are the goals for the next milestone. Um, ethics kind of shows like what we're doing, um, addressing the ethics. Quite a few are in work in progress because the milestone I just started. Feature level status for all the things that we're trying to put in the game. Risks. Fairly straightforward. Um, we don't waste too much time. We usually put it in a presentation so it's easily trackable and our, you, know, you can archive it. Um, maybe there are a couple of other reports. I'm going to show you how that report is
So this is a, an example of a project we work. Um, we are working with this um, Swedish company it was called, called Glorious Games on a project called Dollhouse. Um, it's an online game. Uh, we have a timeline here for releasing certain features. We provide spring comments, usually um, very sort of summary comments. Uh, we tell them what we've done, what we've achieved, what are the objectives for the next sprints, and if there are any recent mitigations. And this like usually kind of a one pager format. Um, we also use this reporting format to communicate cost. Usually when you work on you know, all the scenario, you are invoicing a nominal resource cost. So you want to make sure that the department gets the latest and greatest data uh, as soon as possible. Okay, so those are examples of reporting. Um, and with that, I think we can conclude the GDF. As I mentioned at the beginning of the course, all the documents that you have seen here, I will share with you, uh, so you can, you know, for use at your leisure. I hope you will find this information useful. Please don't forget that the GDF is very much a living document. You should make it your own, continually update it throughout your career because you will get smarter every year. Mm -hmm. If you're working games every year, will be new learnings, new opportunities. And, and the manner in which we do game development has changed so much. When I first uh, started uh, you know, game development jobs in the industry, we were all waterfall. Everything at EA was waterfall. And then, you know, kind of agile rolled in in the early 2000s <laughs> uh, in games. It uh, appeared to sooner than that in other uh, kind of software development, but in games appeared relatively late. Um, and then it was, it was like a brush fight, like it changed the way we build games. Uh, and it's become kind of, you know, it, it has been revised, even agile itself has been revised a few times over, you know, to arrive at the form that we use today. Um, and so everything evolves. The GDF involves make it your own, make it your own studio's version of it. You may feel like certain phases are too convoluted or maybe uh, some sections can be improved or changed or removed entirely. <laughs> Whatever you do, it's not going to be wrong as long as you are following a process that you believe in. And that's the most important thing. You know, if you have process, you've got clarity of purpose, and you're hitting all those markers that help you make a good game. You know, the research, the prototyping, the vertical slice, the attention to people during production, and boom, we have a head. And then you're, that's the best industry to be in. You know, I was talking to Jorge about this. It's, uh, you know, being an indie developer especially is very tough. It's a very competitive industry. Um, it's uh, almost an impossible task to cohesively marry art and technology together. <laughs> uh, but what an amazing uh, accomplishment it is to, to have uh, success, you know, to have a hit. So I wish all of you that outcome in everything that you do now and forever. Cool. Um, there was one more segment in the course that I wanted to hit. Um, and that's very um, kind of interesting because uh, we're talking about, you know, the future and your careers and, you know, what games you may want to tackle and where the opportunities lie. We had quite a bit of a discussion around this yesterday. Um, and um, I wanted to talk to you about games innovation, like innovation in the field of games and where new opportunities lie. Um, I am I'm, I'm very interested personally in this topic and I, you know, I have this presentation that I constantly update to the latest trends uh, and this is no exception. Can you want to find it? Why not, first of all? 
Well, um, I'll give you my answer. So I mean, you, you know, you can tackle this at a philosophical level. You can tackle this in a very personal way. Why would you want to innovate? Maybe there are some personal triggers because you have great ideas and you feel like you need to put this out into the world. But from a practical perspective, you want to innovate because innovation attracts funding. If you're in a startup and you're in an innovative field, uh, in, a, in a blue ocean field, right, where you don't have a lot of competitors, you know, investors are looking for those kind of opportunities. They're looking for multiples. They want to invest one dollar and get uh, one thousand out of it. In order to do that, you have to invest in startups that are innovating, that are trying to do something new, that are trying to open new markets. Um, so when you're pitching to an investor uh, for a business idea that tackles the red ocean, um, you know, it's basically just trying to incrementally improve something that was done pretty well already, uh, that uh, approach will probably not attract funding. Also, if you want to be uh, in a service business, do work for hire, um, do, I don't know, um, provide services to a particular industry. Let's say if you're in games, you want to create an um, art house, you know, you're doing art outsourcing. Uh, that kind of business, even though it can be very profitable and steady going, and it can grow in time to be of a significant size, that type of business will not attract a lot of money. Uh, again, because the multiples that the investors look to generate from it are not going to be impressive. So, if you innovate, if you're trying to do something completely new, your ability to attract funding is much more uh, prevalent. Okay, the second thing, from a practical perspective, if you're innovating, you have a much higher chance of attracting incredible talent. So, there are some people in every, industri in every industry, in every geography that are exceptionally accomplished at what they do. And these people don't work for money. They already make plenty of money in their current roles. Thing. Why would they join your startup or your small studio? It's because you are doing something that they're passionate about. And they can be, you know, product. They're really passionate about that type of game that you're making. Or they may be passionate about the fact that you're trying to do something new, a new technology, a new solution, a new distribution mechanism that they are inspired by. So when you innovate, your ability to inspire others is enhanced and you're going to get great talent from that. Um, partners. If you do something new, and I can tell you, I ran this team at, uh, at Samsung for emerging uh, technologies, and we were always on the lookout for startups that were trying to do something incredible, something new, uh, in this space that I was you know, focused on emerging technologies. Um, for example, we were looking for companies that were making exceptional VR content, so we can feature them into uh, our section of the Oculus Store for VR. Um, we were looking at companies that were innovating with IoT. For example, we were actively looking for games that were using IoT devices to generate an, uh, an experience that was more immersive. Um, so when you're doing something innovative, one of these larger corporations, the larger enterprises, may be interested in what you're developing, and they will provide you with support. It can be um, uh, many kinds of support, from money, like it, effectively they can issue your grant or even invest into your company, to providing you access to their distribution channels. Um, and basically promoting your app or game or feature or whatever you're building. Um, usually these large corporations have other means too to support you. Maybe it's marketing. You know, they can integrate you somehow in their marketing campaign, making a mention to your game. Because your game is innovative and it addresses an unexplored area of the market. And the fourth and the most squishy one is that, you know, fortune favors the bold. Okay? <laughs> if you have this audacious idea that is totally out there, that uh, is trying, you're trying to change industries and change the world for the better, you know, sometimes uh, the universe conspires to provide you with help. So if you think big, you know, sometimes things just like magically have this... Uh, ability to arrange themselves for you to have success. So karma will be the fourth 
prison that you know if you if you, if you think big somehow you have a higher chance of success. So those are my reasons. Again, you can come up with your own personal reason why to innovate, why you should innovate. Um, but in my mind, there's no um, there's no doubt that innovating is the way to go. You know, life is too short. Let's do something really cool and unique. So um, since we're talking about innovation, oh, unfortunately you can't see this picture very well. It looks very clear on my uh, laptop, so I'll have to explain what this is. This is something that you should watch for. And I'm pretty sure there's a 2019 version of this <coughs> graph, but I'm trying to illustrate the point here, so the information within it is not as uh, important. Uh, Gartner, which is a, a massive a company that analyzes industry data. Um, it's a consultancy. Gartner is a consultancy. It's a very reputable consultancy. And one of the things that they do every year is to look at the technologies that um, are emerging or have emerged and to try to map where they lie on the hype cycle, as they call it. Um, and they organize their hype cycle in terms of expectations on the X axis. Um, um, and then they have various categorizations for the stages of hype that those technologies, the emerging technologies undergo. First you have the innovation trigger, that's when effectively it first appears, technology first appears, <coughs> and here you have, in the innovation trigger you have technologies like smart dust, Flying autonomous vehicles. Remember, this is 2018. Mm -hmm. They've already emerged since that. So in 2019, those probably moved up on the hype cycle. Mm -hmm. Actually, these flying autonomous vehicles, I remember it like clearly because about three years ago, I met with a company called Atomic. Atomico, sorry. They're a VC based in Europe that is founded by some folks that used to be investors in PayPal. So they have plenty of money, and they were talking about the fact that they were going to invest in a company that are making that is making a flying car. Oh dear. <laughs> and it sounded so science fiction to me at, at the time that I heard that. But it is an emerging technology, and lo and behold, there are several startups in that field that are effectively producing a kind of hybrid car helicopter thingy. Yeah, personal drone kind of thing. Yeah, exactly, something like that. Um, and it's cool. I mean, I hope they are successful. It might result in legendary traffic that you have here is kind of amazing. Alright, the other one here at the Innovation Twitter is Biotech for Culture and Artificial Tissue. I don't know, I'm surprised that they include it as an Innovation Twitter because I thought that that was banging it off for quite some time. But I think finally there are startups coming to market or um, this technology is coming to market in a way that there's actual commercial potential. There's actual distribution. Oh, absolutely. So I've quoted what are what these things are the innovation thing. The next category is the peak of inflated expectations. So what happens with new technologies? They emerge, people are start reading about it, they get super excited, they get like crazy excited. <laughs> Usually if you have a startup in a particular domain, let's say it's artificial general intelligence, and you happen to be in that startup that has a solution in artificial general intelligence uh, in 2018 when this is just emerging as a hyped technology, your ability to raise money the next year is Great. basically let the money come to me. <laughs> you know, like the VC should line up on this side, angel investors on this side, and the <laughs> <laughs> uh, But uh, truly, I mean, that's, this is the perfect time. Because sometimes with startups, you'll find that often you are too early or too late, mm -hmm. right? You, if you're too early, you don't have a market, nobody really cares about your crazy idea. If you're too late, it, you're fighting against so many other competitors, it's basically a red ocean scenario. Mm -hmm. You want to be exactly on the money. And on the money in 2018 meant artificial general intelligence. And then you, you moved on to like raise money with fantastic valuations for your company and plenty of interest from these things. So now for the peak um, of the inflated expectations, what do we have? We have things like uh, quantum computing. Oh dear. Brain computer interface, which is particularly relevant and a recurring theme in my presentation on games innovation. Deep neural networks, 
um, biochips, deep neural nets, deep learning. This is a function of artificial intelligence. Carbon nanotubes, <coughs> IoT platforms, virtual assistants. Virtual assistants, uh, by the way, let me see, can I? Unfortunately, I don't have a laser pointer, so I'll try to jump. Um, okay, virtual assistant. <laughs> okay, virtual assistant is already on the downturn. If you remember 2018, it was the year that Samsung released Bixby. You know, Amazon released uh, Echo and the Alexa um, a couple of years before that. So it was, a, it was already a little bit smoked, the virtual assistance category. But it was still hyped to the spin rings. It wasn't, it, would, it wouldn't have been bad for you to be in a startup that is <coughs> focused on virtual assistance in 2018. Even though basically what this graph is telling you that is fast moving out of the interest zone. In the next category, the trough of disillusion. After a period of super inflated expectations, there will be an inevitable disappointment. <clears throat> Things didn't pan out, you know, like you'll have this an analysis. Uh, AI systems will generate trillions of revenue in the next three years, right? Uh, when something is hyped, you will hear, you will read articles like that. Right. That basically say this will change the world. You know, all, all uh, you know, jobs in all uh, these categories will become obsolete overnight. Usually it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes it does, but most often it doesn't. And when it doesn't, then the market reacts with, with profound disappointment. Yeah. And uh, VR actually went through that, if you remember, right? And super hyped and then like, oh, VR is shit. You cannot make money in VR. And now it's like, you know, it starts to Whoa. get the slope of enlightenment. Maybe it has reached the plateau of productivity, which is actually there are quite a few studios that are making decent money. Nobody's getting, you know, mega rich, rich from it, but they can make ends meet in the VR space. Uh, now, not all technologies will be productive, right? Some will simply not be workable. They may have uh, some major impediments to broad utilization. <clears throat> but generally speaking, the hype cycle applies to almost everything that emerges in terms of technologies. And this company called Karna is very good about mapping where things are. So now, what do we have in trough of disillusionment? Augmented reality in 2018. Mixed reality was higher up, but still starting to like fall down. Uh, autonomous driving was another one that was moving towards the trough of disillusion over a long period of time. So um, anyway, if you're curious about technology, that's a good thing to keep your eyes every year. Kind of follow this, uh, this report, try to read on it. Uh, research particular categories. For us in games, there will be certain categories that are transformation. Emerging technologies, they have the potential to change the way things are done. Um, the other thing to, to watch out for in terms of opportunities for innovation are you know, trends <coughs> that have something to do with very large companies launching new distribution systems, maybe new platforms coming to market maybe new engines that are in some way or another democratizing game development. But technology is a good place to start to kind of see what's out there in terms of uh, interest and opportunity. <coughs> so here's what we're not going to talk about in this particular presentation. We're not going to talk about virtual reality, stream games, <coughs> wearable, where esports, location-based games on the blockchain. And the, I mean, all of these are innovative, and they're like new and exciting areas in games, okay. but they're pretty much, they're, you know, I feel they're in place, these are all kind of red ocean. Uh, some of them are defunct, like games from wearables. Mm -hmm. No, um, didn't quite find out. Uh, blockchain, there's still some, you know, activity around like using the blockchain to <coughs> to lock in value across an ecosystem of games. 
But again, there are companies that are well funded, they're active in this space, who've been smoking from this pipe for some time. Um, so Streamed games. You're talking about the platforms or the way yeah, we use the stream? Oh, yeah. Streaming. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, the Stadia and. It's already done. Yeah. Small. I mean, it's, it's already out there, it's in the market, the games are played. It's not innovation in itself. Yeah. Right. There's opportunity, of course, in all of this. I'm not dismissing that. So here's opportunities for innovation according to my own research. There's this concept of neural networks. Um, in games, neural networks have the opportunity to affect uh, the behavior and strategy of non-playing characters. Effectively, having AI in games that is significantly smarter than the AI that we had in the past. Well, with neural networks, we become effective tools in games as a result of our limited computation in the cloud. So we can deploy massive amounts of power to create AI that is being smarter than at any time in the history um, of games. And the engine that seems best poised to make use of that is Lumberyard. Lumberyard? Lumberyard is an engine in the cloud in itself. Um, now you can theoretically do it with any other engine. Of course, I'm just providing an example of something that comes kind of built into the system. Um, where the opportunity lies here for game making in my mind is to personalize the player experience. Behavior like responding in real time to user behavior. Um, all particular relevance here is uh, voice controls. You know, we, we currently have a tactile interaction with games. Right? There's a controller and we manipulate whatever happens on the screen uh, through the controller or the touch screen. <laughs> uh, using your voice and having an intelligent conversation with an NPC is like, wow! What the fuck? And the opportunity is right here, it's right next to us. It hasn't been fully realized. What I'm saying is that, okay, that's an opportunity for innovation. A game, a narrative-driven game where you're having an intelligent free-form conversation with an NPC seems like the holy grail. Right? Also, world dynamic procedural generation. This has been done in countless cycles. Um, what is it, the uh, Outer Worlds? Um, that's the one that had it. No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky, yes. yes, yes. Um, any others? Um, uh, is it procedural, the one that's in space? Uh, what's the name of it? Um. Elite was, you know, Elite, the classic game Elite, was procedurally generated. Infinite Galaxy, basically. Yes. Well, there's, uh, there's a bunch of games that use procedural in the development process. Not necessarily in the game, but in the development process. There's a, there's a Mexican game. Well, it's not, well, it's not necessarily in the runtime. It helps a lot to see the uh, Yeah, and I heard about um, procedurally generated animation as well. Yeah. 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 Worlds are still fairly basic, and they're still built out of very narrow elements. Yeah. Ima imagine again unlimited computation. So yeah. you, you're not running this local; you're running it on massive servers. They can generate a world that has infinite detail and variation, um, and you can spend years like just exploring a single planet, and you'll find so much diversity there. And there's uh, there's just this bridge between theoretical uh, limitless and um, well, we humans uh, tend to see patterns. And stuff. So if you uh, you say early noise uh, in the 
to a project manager and say it's procedural. It may be technically, but uh, people can spot patterns pretty quickly. So if it's a whole pattern, then it's going to be all the same. After the third planning, you know, it's, yeah. it's the same quality as the third planning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And that, that, you know, that was my impression as well. Um, so I think, I think that's about to change. Mm -hmm. Because as we have more computation, we have you know, higher number of building blocks um, and potentially infinite building blocks to create these, um, these words. OK, so you know, we've talked a lot about the virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality in general. Synthetic reality is the next frontier in XR. Um, and it was a concept that was proposed by Robert Wolcott in an academic paper that uh, was published in 2017. Um, and it refers to ever-involving realities that are synthesizing our will or preferences consciously or unconsciously provided. Um, so these, these are games that are molded to our individual personality characteristics. Well, that's why Blade Runner's there, right? Awesome. I love her. I know the other ones. Wow. Yes. That's yes. crazy. So it's a, it's a single entity that's actually molded to my reactions to a bit, and it keeps on playing with me because this is my behavior, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, absolutely. <laughs> and it's with you just like you've always imagined an ideal woman dancing. Right, right. And having a game that has the ability to interpret your emotions, and it's actually not that scientific, not that uh, strange to imagine. Um, you, um, you know, you need to have ability to capture emotional states. You know, the tone of your voice communicates a lot. So let's say you have a voice uh, activated game. The tone of your voice, whether you're scared or happy or upset, you know, could, could say a lot to an, a system that is trained to observe these variations or patterns. Also, maybe there is a way to capture your emotional state with two sensors. Maybe you're wearing a device that is capturing your heart rate. The game will know when you're getting excited or when you are getting scared or uh, and reacts to that in, in dynamic fashion and, and molds. Now, obviously, what we're talking about, what we saw in, uh, in the latest Blade Runner uh, that we're having the reference to is a very advanced system that is outside <laughs> of our ability to date via um, or theoretically, maybe practically, there's someone that is doing this already. But it feels a little bit out there, you know, it's a little bit in the, in the realm of science fiction. However, having a game that responds to emotional states. Yeah, that's amazing. Not, mm -hmm. That's something that we can you know, consider. Uh, and, you know, one way to capture these fleeting emotional states is through neural game. Uh, and that ties into the Gartner uh, hype cycle the technology of the. Uh, brain-computer interface. Um, so the, the kind of the leading researcher in this is a gentleman called Adam Gazali. Um, he operates a neuroscape lab at the UC San Francisco. Um, they have been, he is involved with uh, um, a startup called Achille. Um, it's a digital medicine startup, basically using this device that you attach to your, um, that you place on your head. Uh, there are several sensors there that you know, capture your uh, EKG, your brain waves, in other words, and can interpret what that means and transmit that information to a digital experience that, that is relayed through the life, in, through, through a VR concept in this particular uh, setting. Um, and there's been a game called Euroracer, which is designed to improve cognition in older adults. Um, and that's what Achilles is doing, effectively. They're trying to make games that are training your brain. And the, you know, that has happened in the past. There have been like many memory training, brain training games that appear in the market, but none of them have been able to measure the impact on the brain itself. It's just basically giving you exercises that you run through. Now, Euroracer, is designed to improve cognition and recognizes when that effect happens in the brain. Furthermore, you can also control things in the game through your brainwaves. 
Uh, you probably have seen demos already of like, you know, the fact that you can move a cursor on the screen just with your brain waves. You can train your brain to do like pretty in impressive stuff um, uh, using um, kind of a capture mechanism, like a headset capture mechanism, like the one that you've seen in the teacher here. Um, there has been a, there's been a startup called Neurable, Boston-based studio. They made a brain-controlled VR demo for this big sci-fi game called Awakening. They haven't released Awakening just yet, but they've made a demo to check it out. There's also a VC called Jazz Venture Partners <laughs> that specializes in investing in neuroscience uh, startups. Wow. You know, so that's again like one of these things. You know, if you're in this like blue ocean space, there are people that are willing to are just willing check it out. To, to chip in. <laughs> Because they believe too, they've seen that vision of what it could have been uh, in the problem. So yeah, New York Canyon, definitely worth looking into it. Um, another concept in the...